I'm seeing people hiding. And it's not because you're hiding because of sin, but it's like people are hiding and they're refusing to move forward because of everything from shame to fear. And a lot of it's just downright uncertainty. You don't know what to do. But I, I really feel like the Lord is calling, you, and it's, it's a word for many people, if not all of us. And I just feel like the Lord's saying, you need to move forward today. Stop hiding. And again, it's not because I don't feel like it's like people, maybe it's the effects of sin from the past that may be part of it. But God's just saying move forward, that, that you can't hide in the back any longer. With what the Lord's doing, there, there's just a new season and we have to quit hiding. And I don't know the full extent of what that means, but again, some of it is just, just plain uncertainty. And some of it's unbelief. And the Lord's saying, I want you to move forward in this season. And this is not a season for my people to stand in the back. And this is not a season in this moment for the people in this city to be hidden. But this is a moment where I'm causing you to move forward into the light. Don't stay in the dark any longer because of what I'm doing. Deal with that which holds you back and move forward. And I don't... I don't feel the, the Lord's condemnation at all. I feel the urgency. But I feel like the, it's because of the goodness of God and the mercy and the grace of God that He's saying, I want you to move forward right now. There have been some limitations that you've allowed. And God says, I, those aren't from me and those aren't things that I've placed on you. But just deal with them in this moment and move forward. Hallelujah. So Father, we thank You even right now. When, when You say those things, there's a grace that comes upon us to set us free. Father, thank you for a grace that is present to set us free at this moment, God. We don't have to hide because of this season that we're moving into. You're calling your people forward. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. So just receive that grace right now. Just receive that grace to move out of, out of the darkness, out of, out of the lack out of fear move forward thank you god now that, that's i think that's a word individually for many people i think it's a word for us corporately as well thank you god thank you god lord we just receive right now we receive the grace that you're pouring out thank you god thank you god hallelujah amen is god good yes amen so just receive that grace and empowering amen thank you god hallelujah praise god god's good amen Gideon on on the house and uh the lord's saying yeah i want you to come out because i'm calling you out of your caves amen i'm calling you out of your hiding places and i'm calling you into a place of where where my angel hallelujah. the angel of the lord is with you and he's there to pull you out and hallelujah. he's there to bring deliverance and he's there to provide and he's there to open doors yeah. where you thought the doors were closed. God said the doors are open. Amen. Proceed in faith. Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it's impossible to oh, please yeah. me. But he that comes to me must believe that he is and I'll reward you. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So praise God. So no hiding in the wine press. Amen. I just want Ariel, and Ariel has a strong seer gift, um, and uh, maybe one of the strongest just raw seer anointings that um, I've seen. You know? and, uh, but I just want her to share what the Lord's been showing her, okay? And you can share it in exactly the manner that you wrote it, um, so just, just share that, Amen. Um, actually, I've been seeing it for a few weeks, um, several actually. So um, so what I've been seeing is Ardmore, and it's covered in like this dome or a bubble, for lack of a better word. And it goes from north of the Arbuckles as far south as I can see. I see it from like the east side. Um, and But in this, it's ripped open. It looks like, for the best way to describe it, it's like if you took a waterbed, suspended it, and ripped it with a big knife, um, north to south. And so from this, there are angels pouring through. Um, and there's this water as far as it's ripped open. It's just pouring out. But these angels are going out in the city and are releasing things. 
and I really get the impression that they're here on assignment. I don't have anything beyond that. But. Amen. So let God do what He wants to do. Amen. There's there's an opening up. Amen. And I think a lot of us are sensing that. There's something that's shifting, but there's an opening up. Amen. And let the Lord just, let's continue to pray and believe for that further just to open up. And many of us are aware, and I don't know that Ariel is, but um, many, many years ago, probably in the early 80s, Dr. Sam Matthews saw um, a tear is what the word that he would use in the heavenly realm. And, uh, you know, we might, trendy lingo might call it a portal, but he, he literally saw a tear in the heavens over the state of Oklahoma. And um, when that happened, he saw over the course of several weeks and months, 150,000 people in the state get born again. And, and these weren't backslidden people. These weren't people changing churches. Right, these were newly born again people, and it was because of a crack that he saw opening up. And so, I think the Lord's saying something. I think we're moving into something, and and I just know even that one of the words that Ryan Lestrange uh, gave us was that um, we would decree something, and it would um, affect the entire state. And so, Father, I thank you. Father, that there's something opening up in the heavenly realm over this city and over this state. Father, there is a point of heaven coming to earth. Lord, there's a point of that opening up for revival, awakening, and transformation that you've promised to many of your servants, God, and it's happening in this moment. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for what's opening up. And Lord, we thank you for what you're doing at this moment. And it's not just for our city. Father, but it's for a state that you've destined for revival and awakening. Father, I thank you for what's happening, what you've promised in, in the Dallas area. But Father, I thank you for the promises that you've given for Oklahoma that, that we would get to go first. And Father, that there's a glory that's moving up and down north and south north, uh, from uh, across I-35. Thank you for what you're doing, God. Father, I thank you that there is a, re a revelation of your glory that's coming forth. Father, just as, you, just as Wayland prophesied about uh, the harvest, God, that there was, a, there was a recruitment that's happening because of the harvest. God, we thank you today that that is further opening up. Father, that the harvest is coming forth in this city and in this state, that you, Jesus, have broken the Oklahoma resistance. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We glorify you today in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Amen. Do you feel something shifting? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is a shift that's happening even now. Thank you, God, for the shift. I thank you for the shift that's happening, God. And if there's a shift, then we have to be in position for what you've called us to do. No more hiding. There's no more hiding. There's no more of standing in the back expecting someone else to do it. Hallelujah. He's calling people to the front. So, hallelujah. Deal with your stuff, not because God's angry, but deal with your stuff because He loves us and He wants us to put all those things aside so that we can step into what He's called us to do because this doesn't happen without us partnering with the move of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. Praise God. Jamie, come and give announcements. Is that good? Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We just thank you, God. Thank you for what you're doing. We bless what you're doing today, God. Reveal your glory in all the earth. Manifest your glory in this city and in this place and in our lives today, God, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So come on up. Praise God. Now, at this time, as we're doing that, let's go ahead and dismiss the kids to go to their program. Amen. And we just thank God for what He's doing in the kids program. They're excited. Right? 
and the whole middle section just left. <laughs> Praise God. And uh, just speaking for my family, I thank you guys for your prayers for my dad. Um, you know, he's, he's recovering and um, many, many, encountering many issues, but continue to pray for him. Amen. He needs your prayers and continue to pray for us as a family as we care for him. Hallelujah. All right. It seems like there was something else I was going to announce, but maybe it'll come to me. But uh, praise God. God's good. Amen. Wow. I thought Jamie was just going to preach this morning. She needed her, um, her camo pants on, right? Because sometimes we, we call her Sarge. Do you see why? Right? She's, she's making those de decrees and commands. Amen. Now, I want to I give some language, and we didn't really get to do this last week very much because of, of what we released about God's heart uh, for adoption and fostering and God's heart for the poor and all those things. Because, uh, and man, that, that battle is just intensifying, isn't it? Yeah. And there's some crazy things happening. It, it, it disturbs me when um, people don't get upset when uh, uh, a politician is all for in, uh, children being born and the deciding even after their birth if they can live or not, um, that's a whole other topic, you know. I'll try to stay off that today, but that battle is definitely intensifying, and we need to pray for just revival and awakening to further come forth in our nation. It's, it's a sad moment when we call evil good and good evil. Right. right. And we actually have abortionists saying that they're doing God's work. I just don't understand that. So, hallelujah. I'll not get back on that today, but it so grieves me. But I wanted to reflect and look at some of the things that, um, you know, the Lord was saying through Wayland to us as a body. Because when I get prophetic words and we get prophetic words as a church, I meditate and reflect on those and pray into them. And I want to give some further language um, to what the Lord was saying. Now, one of the things that Wayland said, and we've had other, people's, other people uh, declare this, but that there is a forerunner anointing upon us. Okay? Now, what the heck does that mean? All right? What does it mean when you're a forerunner anointing? Is that just one of those prophetic terms that people throw around? But, you know, um, but Jesus was actually a forerunner. And uh, in Hebrews 6.20, it talks about that he was a forerunner for us, right? And, and he went into the presence of God and he did certain things. But Jesus actually became a forerunner of a new way to live, yeah. right? Where he, he introduced and he allowed us to become new creations who are born again and moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, yeah. right? He became a forerunner for that. And there are many other forerunners that are in the Word. And, and forerunners come not only to announce a shift, right, and something new, which is what John the Baptist did. He became a forerunner. He came first declaring, this is what's coming. Jesus is coming. And, and this, this shift is coming. But a forerunner also comes as a catalyst for a shift, right, where uh, they're not only declaring something, but they're actually causing a change to begin. How many of you realize that there's a great shift happening in the church today? Yeah. Right? And it's not just, you know, when we talk about the new wineskin and, and the, the days of renewal in the church, that's more than just, and hear me, this isn't a criticism, it's more than just meeting on Saturday night instead of Sunday morning. It's more than just watching a live feed. Those are all valuable things. But there's, there's a shift in, in the way we, I don't want to say do church because we are the church, but there's a way, there's a shifting in the way that, that God is, is giving vision and understanding of how the church is to function. Amen. And so the forerunner anointing causes that to happen. Amen. There are many forerunners in the body of Christ. Uh, we see it throughout history where people uh, became forerunners for something and they, they brought a reality, a kingdom reality, and restored something into the church that had been lost, but it restored something. Amen. 
And that's happening a lot and with increased frequency, amen. And we could go into church history and how God's been restoring things, especially over the last 100 and 120 years, amen. But forerunners also, they see something in the future that God's wanting to do, and they bring it into the present so that it can become a normal for others, right? They see something and they're like, God, this is what we've tasted of something and we're, we're not only seeing it and we're not only teaching on it, we're not only prophesying about it, but we're bringing a kingdom reality into the present realm that will cause a shift. That's what a forerunner anointing does and there are different degrees of that. Um, sometimes God does it for the entire body of Christ and then I, I, I'm just going to say this, you guys, and I, it's probably going to sound arrogant, but I don't really care. But God's given us a forerunner anointing in this church to shift a city and a region. Right? There's something that we have to break something open, and the Lord's doing it. And I, I felt a shift a couple, and, you know, a couple of weeks ago, even when Wayland was here, because like Wayland said, he said, I, I, one of the assignments that God's given him in the last year is to come in as a midwife and help birth what is already in process. And so there is a birthing, there is a tearing open. Hallelujah. I, I hate to use that term when talking about birthing, right? <laughs> Ouch. But, <laughs> but there's something that's opening up in the heavenly realm and that is causing us, God's wanting us to move into it. And there's, a, there's an unction and there's a propelling forward, moving forward. Amen. And I, I believe that God's doing something. And I, you know, there, there's a, this service is such an intercession. Yeah. Right? I mean, we felt that. We felt that moving forward and those words and those declarations. But it's, there's, a, there's a, a birthing and a pushing forward. And, you know, there are many forerunners in Scripture besides Jesus, but one that I want to zero in on this morning, and I don't know how far we're going to get. It's almost 1130. We have communion, you know. But, but David is an example of someone in the Old Testament who modeled what I believe a forerunner anointing looks like, modeling what the apostolic church movement is supposed to look like, I mean, there were things that he, as an, as an Old Testament king and prophet, re saw. He tasted of something. He saw something, and he pulled it into his time and did things that the law forbid him from doing. Right? And he, he, he built a tabernacle of presence and of worship that transitioned and changed Israel entirely. And because he established that of presence and tabernacling and the glory of God, and the tabernacle introduced the glory of God in a new way into Israel. And, and David, who was a man of war, right, who, who lived in, in, many, in a lot of craziness, ushered in the kingdom in a new way, right? And saw a major shift and transition into the kingdom in which allowed his son to rule and reign in a new way. Now, his son wasn't perfect, right? And that's another topic, another story. Neither was David, right? But because he had a heart for God and to pursue God, and he had a heart for worship, the spirit of David that was on him, that same spirit came into a tabernacle and changed Israel. And Israel became known as Zion. Now, one of the things that, um, that Wayland kept talking about, he said, I just keep seeing a whole lot of glory. Amen. There's all this glory and there's this greater glory that's coming. Right? right, and I think he and, and Zion is the place where God's manifest glory dwells. Right, the week before Wayland came, um, I had three dreams, three nights in a row. Right, and uh, I'll say a little bit more about it without saying a whole lot about it. 
right? The first dream, I was in this church, and um, we were still part of this church, but I was in another church. And um, after it was over, somebody walked up to me, and they were like, well, what did you think of the service? And I said, well, it's wonderful what you're doing, but we don't fit here. And people got really angry at me. You don't say that. You know, <laughs> I did in my dream, right? I said, I bless what you're doing, but what we're doing doesn't fit in this paradigm. The next night, I again, I was in a different church, and I, I was still part of this church, but I was bringing a, helping birth a ministry. And then and some of those details are all very private because, you know. And then finally, the third dream I had, and I knew God was going to say something, and when I went to bed the third night, I was like, if, if I have another dream about a church I know, God, you're saying something. Well, that night I dreamt that the church, Glory of Zion, and, and you know, it's not literally coming here, but the name is key. The Glory of Zion had come to Ardmore. And I was like, God, you're saying something. There's a glory out of Zion. There's a manifest presence of your glory that's coming into our city in a new way, right? That God's manifesting his glory. And so, you know, what, what is glory? What is glory, right? Is it just some la-la realm? Right? And now, let's just talk about God's glory a little bit. And we know... Again, that David, David was, you know, he established the tabernacle, but we know in these days, and some of these truths are very foundational to us, but I just want to give a bit of attention to them and then go into something else. But we know in this time in which we're living, the tabernacle of David is being restored. Right? Acts 15, 16. Let's read that together. And basically, you know, they, the, the council at Jerusalem, they're, they're meeting because... All the Gentiles are getting saved. Not all of them, but many Gentiles are getting saved. And, you know, they meet together to form doctrine. How many you know doctrine's a good thing? We make fun of it, and we think it's religious, but doctrine is actually a very, very good thing. And so they're like, is this really the Lord? And so they're meeting together to decide, can the Gentiles get saved? And so uh, in Acts 15, 16... It says, after these things, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it in order that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. So there's a restoration of something that had been lost. And, you know, part of it was a, a restoration of presence and glory that was coming on the church in a greater way. And it was coming so that the Gentiles might get saved, that all the nations would come to the glory of God. Amen? And so uh, this, this thing of, you know, what we know what David did, right? And so he took the Ark of the Tabernacle and he allowed, he pitched a tent around it. It already was in Moses' Tabernacle and was at Obed-Edom's house for a while, Right? And Obed-Edom started, started prospering in everything he did because the presence and the glory of God was there. And so David was like, let's, let's, get a, let's move the ark, right? And, and so David, in time, he sets up a, this tabernacle and he, he puts musicians and, and singers and intercessors that just, they 24-7, they worship in the presence of God. Now... In the law, you weren't even supposed to go into the holy place. You could, one guy could do it once a year, and he had to be clean um, ceremonially, right? Who's re oh, my gosh, those of you that are doing the daily Bible reading, aren't you ready to get out of Leviticus? Yeah. Isn't it the worst, right? <laughs> but, you know, the videos are great, right? <laughs> but, um, but, you know, and if, and if they weren't clean, they dropped dead. Right? But David, man, they, they just surrounded, they just surrounded the ark with worship. Yeah. Right? And this incredible glory began to come to the land and begin to come to Zion. And and you know, much of the Psalms were written about the manifest presence and glory of God. Wow. And, and that, that tabernacle of David, it's a place and it provides an atmosphere for the glory 
and the manifest presence of God. And the Lord's presence brought healing, miracles, and deliverance. Amen. Now, it's interesting, the same spirit that was on David, and we know that David was a psalmist, right? But what did he do? What did he do when he went in and played, you know, when he was, when he was working for Saul, basically? He'd go in and he'd play, and it said that Saul would get refreshed. And not only would Saul get refreshed, the demon that harassed Saul would leave. Have you, ever been in a, have you ever been in a presence where the glory of God is so thick that demons or people are getting set free from demons? I have. It's crazy. You know, you're sitting there and sometimes the manifestations are more extreme than others. Right? Um, and we'll talk about a lot of this in deliverance in supernatural school this week, right? But, you know, Paul, Saul, he'd get set free, and that thing would leave. Now, the bad thing was he allowed it to come back, right? I've watched that happen to people. When there's a glory of God, and they, they get set free, and I've watched them get set free, and then they go out and let that thing come back. You know, and that's tragic, but, the, you know, the glory of God on the tabernacle of David, it brought this miraculous move of God. And not only did people, was there the miraculous, but it started changing the land. Hallelujah. I want the manifest glory of God not only to produce healing, miracles, and deliverance, but I want it to start changing the land. Yes. Amen. Now, we, we looked a, a few weeks ago when we were talking about values. We talked about the glory of God being tied to God's goodness. Yes. Right? Exodus 33. What happened when Moses said, God, I want to see your glory? Well, the Lord say, said, okay, Moses, here I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'm going to show you my goodness. Right? So we know that God's glory is linked to His goodness. God, His character, His compassion, His abounding love, His willingness to forgive, His perfect justness, those, that all has to do with His goodness, and it all has to do with His glory. Right? Now, when you study the glory of God... There are many ways that God manifested His glory in the Word, but the greatest references to the glory of God are always tied to signs, wonders, and miracles. It always is. And let's, let's just look at a few examples of that. Amen. And I'm, I'm going through my notes really quick. So, hallelujah. Let's look at John chapter 2, verse 11. John chapter 2, verse 11. Jesus' first miracle. Turning the water into wine. Oh, my goodness. That's crazy. I, some of y'all are getting ideas. I saw it in your face right then. Okay. Everybody's like, hmm. So, <laughs> but, it, and it's crazy, and it says um, in verse 11, this beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. He, the manifestation of his glory was a sign, right? And an unusual sign. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that we always, some people are like, well, we have to see it in the Bible, and I'm pro-Scripture. But every manifestation of His glory. But I don't see many people wanting this sign in their church. Um, just saying. Right. Some people do. Right. Some of y'all, yeah. <laughs> They're all in Texas. It's true. And, and when, he, <laughs> when He manifests, I know someday I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to surprise y'all someday when we do communion. I'm just saying. <laughs> or maybe Jesus. Do it again, Jesus. Right. And... Uh, <laughs> Man, there was a lot of faith in that. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Jesus may have already done it for some of y'all before church. I don't know, right? <laughs> but 
feel increasing faith, right? <laughs> but Jesus manifested his glory. And what does it say? His disciples believed in him. What's that? I bet they did. <laughs> Their faith, right? But when Jesus manifests his glory and produces signs, wonders, miracles, deliverance, it produces faith. Right? It produces a faith. Now, sometimes people still get mad. Isn't it weird when people get mad when people get healed? That is just the weirdest thing. Right? Some people have more faith in the devil than they do in God. Right? And again, I know we have to judge things. I know there's crazy things that happen, but, you know, God brings glory and it produces faith and belief. Amen? Another passage of Scripture, John 11, 4. Let's turn there since we're in the book of John. This is the story of Lazarus. Amen. And isn't it funny when people preach about Lazarus at funerals? <laughs> you know, because... <laughs> now, don't preach about Lazarus at a funeral unless you're going to raise that person from the dead. You know... I have a lot I could say about that, but I'm not going to. Hallelujah. It's a bit of a bit of a sore spot for my family. But I, yeah. So moving along, I'm trying I'm trying not to camp here. I let John, John eleven four. Now when Jesus heard about Lazarus' death, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now, that's not the end of the story. Of course, people might call Jesus a false prophet because Lazarus died. But Jesus had already seen what he was going to do. Amen. And so in verse 40, we know, of course, we know over the course of this that he raises, he resurrects Lazarus from the dead. It's a great story, right? And a great account, not a story. And, um, you know, it says in verse 39, Jesus said, Remove the stone. And Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. The Bible just puts it out there in reality, doesn't it? And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Right? Right? Jesus calls Lazarus forth. He arises from the dead. He resurrects. And we see the glory of God. Right? We see the demonstration of His goodness in the miraculous. And again, it, a lot of people believed when they saw it. But again, a lot of people got mad. Right? Because it upset their paradigm. Right? And, 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 you know, you always, if you study the book of Acts, you'll always see when the glory of God gets manifested. You see it in the Gospels, too. And there's a release of the miraculous. The Antichrist spirit gets stirred up. We've talked about this before because Christ means the anointed one. So if it's an Antichrist spirit, it is an anti-anointing spirit. And you can talk about Jesus a lot, and the Antichrist spirit won't get that upset. But if you start moving in glory, and the glory of God starts manifesting, people will, that, that Antichrist spirit will stir something up. Amen? Now, I believe God's in the process of dealing with the Antichrist spirit in this region. He, he's wanting to move. And uh, he's wanting to release and reveal his glory. Now, some people are, I, I, I don't know, I think there's always going to be an element of people opposing the move of God. Right. Yes, sir. I, I think that's just, I, I don't have faith for that not to happen because until 
we completely see a new heaven and a new earth manifested, right? Um, there's going to be, a, God will deal with that spirit eventually. But the wheat and the tares are growing up together, right? So, uh, but, but the glory of God, He manifests, amen, uh, His goodness, His righteousness, amen. Hallelujah. So God wants His church, His people, to be a place of His manifest glory. To be a place of His goodness. We even see, you know, when you, when you study sometimes Zion and what all happens in Zion. Amen. And <clears throat> I'm going to find this scripture in a minute. Oh, here it is. Psalm 110, verse 2. Psalm 110, verse 2. When, when out of Zion, right... The Lord will stretch forth thy strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of thine enemies. Right? From out of Zion, right? And we're not just talking about a geographic place, but we're talking about a place of the manifest presence and glory and goodness of God, that God will extend his scepter of authority and rule in the midst of his enemies. We've got to become, and praise God, we're becoming, we're in process, but we're becoming that place of his glory and his presence. That God will rule in the midst of enemies. Amen. And, you know, we know that there's a process of putting those things down. Right? And the word says that finally that last enemy to be put down will be death. Are we seeing forerunner anointings to deal with the power of death? Yes. Are we seeing ministries that are seeing the dead raised even? Yes. Yes. Right? That's happening. They're forerunners because God is introducing His glory so He can bring those things to pass and into manifestation. And we have to be people of glory. Right? When we start getting, you know, so much more happens in the glory realm. Isn't it often awesome? that we have gifts that God uses, right? They're gifts of healing and all those things. But when the glory comes, it's so much more powerful. When the glory comes and starts touching people in communion and healing and presence, and that starts happening first, so we just bless what God's doing, right? heard Randy Clark talk about one time, and I believe they were in North Carolina, and the glory cloud showed up. And they didn't know what to do. That's one thing I love about Randy, right? He's so real, and he's so honest, and he learns from where he misses it, and he doesn't try to cover it up. And they did have some people get healed, right? But he talks about, if it happened again, what I would do was get... The, most, the sickest people first and have them go into the glory cloud and just have that happen, right? And, and you know, but we have to be people of His glory, right? And I believe that there's such a glory coming on the church. Are we seeing glimpses of it? Are we seeing it coming at times? But isn't there a, in, in seasons of revival that you study revival... The glory of God was on cities, it was on nations, it was on people. And it just brought such a shift and it healed the land, right? Out of Zion, he will extend his scepter that he might rule in the midst of his enemies. Out of, the Zion, out of Zion, out of the manifest presence, out of the glory of God, God, we ask you today, we ask you today, God, we ask you today to extend your scepter. We ask you today that out of Zion, out of the manifest glory, out of the manifest presence today, that you would rule in the midst of your enemies, that you would overturn enemies today. Father, antichrist spirits, fear, mocking spirits, unbelief, 
God, that You would overturn those things today. We decree it not only for this city, but God, for this state, God. Let it go forth all throughout the state of Oklahoma. Father, all throughout the state of Oklahoma. All throughout this nation, God. We decree, God, let Your glory come forth. Hallelujah. So, I've been praying it this morning, but when we start saying things like, you know, you know, Lord, glorify Your name. Lord, glorify Your name. Remember that old song? Glorify Your name. Glorify Your name in all the earth, right? What are we doing? We're asking God to work His mighty power in our midst. God, glorify Your name. Let that become our prayer. In this moment, God, glorify Your name. You know, anybody ever heard that, that old expression, boy, don't touch the glory? Right. Don't touch the glory. And there's truth to that. But I, I would almost venture to say that one of the greatest ways that we touch the glory of God is when we embrace cessationism, which is the belief that signs, wonders, miracles, gifts, those things have ended and they're no longer for today. Well, that's seriously touching the glory of God. That's one of the most hellish doctrines on the face of the earth right now. Right? And if we say don't touch the glory of God, man, that doctrine negates the glory. Right? But we have to become people of His glory. So, I want you this week to begin to decree Psalm 110, verse 2. Right? The Lord will stretch forth His strong scepter from Zion, saying... Rule in the midst of thine enemies. Right? Ask the Lord to extend his scepter. Right? Ask the Lord to extend his scepter in this city. Ask the Lord to extend his scepter in your life. Ask the Lord to extend his scepter in your family, in your business, in your circle of influence, in your community. Amen? Ask the Lord to extend that. Amen? Because they're enemies He's wanting to overturn. Amen? And, you know, the thing, I, the thing that I love, and again, you guys, I believe in warfare, obviously, you know, but um, I don't believe in random warfare. <laughs> right? And, and Israel actually shifted, and I mentioned this earlier, when the tabernacle of David was established. And those enemies started being dealt with because of glory and because of presence. Right? So if you want to deal with something in a region, what do you do? You build presence. You establish presence. Amen. And you move from a place of presence. Amen. Let's be people of glory. Let's be people of presence. Amen. Let's go after him. And, I, you know, this has been one of the things that we've really purposed to do from the very beginning, right? And that means that we move with the glory. It means that we minister to him in our worship, right? And we allow the glory of God. Have you sensed an increasing glory in these last days? I mean, our worship is always good. We've always had presence, Right? But there's, there's a shaking that's coming forth from our worship right now. Right? There is a shaking that is happening as His glory is coming forth. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's transition. Amen. Isn't God good? Hallelujah. So, Lord, we ask Your glory to come. Father, we ask Your glory just to come. Glorify Your name. In all the earth. Amen. So, as we prepare to take communion this morning, I just want to read uh, from Luke. Amen. And uh, Luke um, 22, verse 14. And when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. 
And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when we had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after he had eaten. they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So, Lord, we want to thank you today as we partake of the Lord's Supper, of your table, Lord. God, we come today and we thank you that we do this in remembrance of you. We do this in honor of you. We do this, God, thanking you for... Uh, the tremendous sacrifice, not only that Jesus you made and that it was poured out in your blood, but Lord, that all the benefits of the covenant are available to us. All of, uh, the new covenant is, is it's come into our lives because of the blood of Jesus. And Lord, we just approach your table today. Father, we approach your table and we come in remembrance, but Lord, we come in expectation to receive grace. We come to receive salvation. We come to receive healing. Uh, Father, spirit, soul, and body, God, thank you for what you produce, what you do in the mystery of, of the Lord's table. Thank you, God. We bless uh, the elements of the Lord's Supper. And Father, we just expect to receive today as we celebrate, Lord, your crucifixion, your resurrection, your ascension today. Thank you, God. We bless and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as Logan plays music, just come and receive the elements and go and sit and partake of the Lord's table. Amen. So let's just come. Let your glory be revealed, Lord. Let your glory be released through us. Father, there's a glory even that's in us. And Father, let it be revealed let it be released. Let it be manifested, Lord, all throughout this day, all throughout this week. We give you glory and honor today, God, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Bless you guys. Remember, if you need prophetic ministry, uh, we'll have prophetic team here. If you need uh, physical healing, there'll be a physical healing team here to pray for you. So praise God. Have a good week. And uh, be blessed. Hallelujah. Have a good one. Go Rams. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't care. <laughs> Bless you guys.